joined SASDOC a little while ago and are part of their founder circles. It's been absolutely brilliant for us. We first came into it to further our community, our reach, our network, and to learn from some of the world-class speakers that SASDOC has come and speak. And I have to say, it has been absolutely superb for us. Welcome to the SAS Revolution Show. I'm your host, Alex Seema, and delighted to be joined today by Dan Westgarth, who is the COO at Deal. Welcome, Dan. Hey, hey, Alex. How are you doing? Yeah, good, good stuff. Great to have you on the podcast. So we've got a fellow Brit, but you're not in the UK at the moment. No. Whereabouts are you? I'm in, I'm in America. I'm stateside. Yeah, stateside. And is, is New York, I, I think, so do you base there? Yeah, I'm in New York today, and it's, it's a beautiful day outside. It's probably 30 degrees, a bit warmer than London. Oh. Yeah, very <laughs> so. nice. I haven't been to New York. I want to say 2019 was probably the last time, so like pre COVID. So I would uh, love to come back at some point. But you know, I, I mean, certainly looking at like flights are still pretty expensive to the US. So I'm hope, hopefully they'll uh, come down at some point. I don't know if they, if they will, but we've, we booked some flights to San Francisco for September and premium economy was, was super expensive. And yeah, hopefully things will change uh, soon. How long have you been in the US? I first moved here about four years ago. I'm in and out right now between the UK and the US, but the US journey started Revolut. I moved over from London to New York to help set up Revolut in the States. Very cool. Well, we're getting like some insight there into yourself, for, like being stateside, working for Revolut before, but let's tell the audience, let's go a little bit deeper about, you know, who is Dan Westgarth? Sure. So I am a Brit. I grew up in County Durham on a farm. So definitely a, a country boy came from generations of, uh, of farmers. So my father was a farmer, as was his father, so on and so forth. So I was the first first guy in the family to break the tradition and kind of move to the city. First job fresh out of school was um, was at Revolut. So I, I joined Revolut as uh, an analyst and I left there as general manager. I was the general manager for Revolut in North America, responsible for setting up and running the two businesses in the US and Canada. Also an angel investor. So I run a small syndicate out of London. Its name is Expansion Capital, and we invest and back early stage companies, many ex Revolut founders, fintech companies, prop tech companies, HR tech companies. And I'm CEO of Deal. I've been working with Deal for a number of years now. Um, I joined the company when it was about 10, 20 people, somewhere in that range. I don't know the exact number. Um, but pre, pre-Series A, pre-pandemic. Uh, and today I run the operations department, which is about 500 people globally. And I have a lot of fun doing it. What is the founding story of Deal? What, and what does Deal do? And why did you leave Revolut to, to join Deal and become an, you know, employee number 10 and, uh, and now head up global operations? So founding story of Deal... I was introduced to the to the founders through an investor in, in Revolut. Pretty interesting story. I was on, taking a flight from New York to San Francisco. It was the first time I'd experienced in-flight Wi-Fi, which I thought was pretty James Bond and cool. I received uh, an email from a, from a billionaire, which I also thought was pretty cool. And they were, it was introducing me to the founders of Deal. Um, and normally I, I wouldn't take such a meeting because schedule is, is packed, but I happened to have a slot in my calendar. And I thought, okay. I'll, I'll go meet these guys, see, see what's up. And when I met with them, they wanted to build a fintech company. In the, in the first iteration, I think that's what that's what deal was. And if you look at the early transactional database um, at deal, it's designed very much like a financial technology platform. And in the first iteration, deal would help contractors generate invoices and receive payments for those invoices while also ensuring that the contractors and the clients that are paying them were, were compliant. Which I thought was, was pretty interesting, you know, kind of watched them grow, made friends with uh, the team via WhatsApp, via calls, 
and I, I always thought they were pretty pretty interesting group of people that could execute and, and and had and had vision. I think then came along the pandemic, and the whole world moved to a remote remote model or hybrid model or something like that, and Deal became super relevant. And I think Deal realized, well, you know, not only do we want to help contractors raise invoices, but we want to be the platform for the future of work, and we want to help companies and remote workers get on and, and do their job. The deal kind of changed its strategy somewhat and moved out of this kind of like fintech contract platform into, um, into a people platform, a HR platform, which is really centered around the customers. It's centered around the people organization and finance organization of the companies that use us but then also the the workplace experience or, or work experience, employee experience for the remote workers, which I think is, is fantastic. And by that time, I'd already, already joined the company and was kind of on the rocket ship. What data? So as you mentioned, like Deal is, is a rocket ship, had, you know, tremendous growth, you know, over the last sort of like couple of years. What data can you share in terms of headcount, you know, revenue, growth rates, capital raised, uh, anything like that to help our, our listeners get a bit of a picture in terms of what sort of rocket ship it is? Sure. So Deal's a quite an interesting company. We grew from 1 million in ARR to 100 million in ARR in a very short time period. We hold ourselves out as being the fastest to do so. In terms of corporate stage corporate development we're a series d company we've raised about 650 million dollars in capital we've, we're also completing our fourth acquisition right now which will bring the total headcount of the group to about 1700 people i think the goal for us in the next couple of years is is to be at a billion dollars in arr pretty good growth uh, <laughs> i mean and, and you know not saying that that lightly, it's, uh, it, it, it's excellent. And as you say, I mean, you, you guys hold yourself as the fastest to get from 1 million to 100 million. You know, as far as I know, it probably is the case, right? On, on that, so obviously Deal made this kind of like strategy change, move away from like the FinTech to, you know, this HR platform, Future of Work and enabling, you know, remote workers or, I guess, dig digitally distributed, you know, kind of a workforce. And there was a benefit that probably Deal had because of the pandemic, like many SaaS companies did as well, and like Zoom and, and Hopin and, and so on. And, and just so I, I had um, I just a podcast call just before this with the CEO of Whereby, where similarly, they had experienced great growth and demand during the pandemic. But then that demand really kind of like, you know, dropped off post pandemic. With you guys, are you, you see, because I, I think Zoom is seeing this a little bit, you know, Shopify and, you know, hop in. I think you've probably seen some of the stories there in terms, obviously, you, you know, you know the, the demand for the virtual product is not at there as much and they've had to make, you know, significant cuts. But how is it for deal? Like you've had this great growth, you, you know, is the demand there? Is this still continuing? I think really we diversified significantly from the pandemic trend. I mentioned the initial product start of the pandemic was contractors raising invoices and being paid. Now deal is so much more than that. So as a customer on our platform, we can run your domestic payroll, we can run your international payroll, we can help you hire employees of record, we can still do all of the contractor stuff. We're still very much fintech core. So um, a lot of the employee benefits, contractor benefits that we give are fintech in nature. For example, we have products like um, earned wage access. We have products like uh, a, deal, a deal card. We have healthcare, we have insurances, we have all of this type of stuff. But most importantly, we're not just serving businesses that are um, exclusively remote. We want deal to be relevant for every business in the world. And if you think about where we started, where we are now and where we're headed, we're moving in that direction of becoming that essential piece of software for everyone. You know, we don't just want to be sending payments to contractors. We want to be that key HR information system. 
We want to be the eventually the applicant tracking system. We want to integrate with talent marketplaces. We want to look after post employee li- li- life cycle. You know, when you right now most companies when they terminate an employee, you know, maybe maybe they'll sign a severance agreement and give them some money, but that that post termination life cycle doesn't really happen, and that's a big issue for many companies. That's another problem we want to solve. So. Um, di- really diversified from from the pandemic and, and and had so about twelve months ago. Makes sense and a, and a, a good strategy. And I think you you know from what we've seen or like uh, some people you know the founders that I've spoken to, some didn't necessarily have a plan for like or seemingly didn't look like you know there there was a plan for post pandemic and didn't know what the world was going to look like post pandemic. But from what I'm hearing, like twelve months sort of pre pandemic, there was like okay we're we're experiencing this, you know, acceleration of growth, which is getting some of, some of it's from the benefit, you know, of, of the pandemic. But then post that, you know, we're planning the strategy, we're diversifying, you know, we're going bigger than that and kind of protecting that. So, uh, yeah, it seems like a smart move. What less like, you, you know, given that you've grown from, you know, one to a hundred million in, you, you know, such a short time, what are maybe some of the, 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 the lessons, like one or two lessons that you could share you know, from that period to, you know, the, those that are listening to the podcast? I think hiring ahead is a really important concept. So maybe if, if you're running a business, let's say you're hiring a head of operations, maybe your operations team is 20 people and you're thinking, well, I have this amazing candidate, but they're managing a team of 150. They've dealt with a book of business, which is a hundred times larger than ours. And um, they've never done this before. They've never come to this really early stage. I think if that candidate is is right and all of the other criteria are met, hiring ahead can be really valuable. You almost feel like your business and company is growing into that hire, and that produces a lot of efficiency. I think that's one thing. I think the second thing is, especially in SaaS, Customer support should not be seen as a cost center. It should be seen as a competitive advantage. We've invested a ton into customer support and the fruits of that are, are amazing. That's one of our competitive advantages in comparison to competition, having really, really good support. I would say the final, I don't know, three points, right? So so hiring ahead, customer support. I think the, the, the third one is is don't be afraid to take incremental steps. Um, I think that greatness can be achieved baby steps at a time. You know, you don't have to have this huge master plan that's fully thought out in order to build something, in order to go to market with something. You can literally build it matchstick by matchstick and still produce something, which is really cool. Great lessons kind of shared there. And and something I wanted to pick your brains on because I know obviously you've done this with with Revolut you 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 brought Revolut to the US and you know expanded there and you know have expertise around this obviously like with deal is is, is it around the topic of international expansion so like first of all like how do you select like when you th- think if you're a SaaS company and where I mean wherever you're based if you Europe or US going to Europe but like how do you really kind of select the geos that you're going to kind of like first of all I think in very broad strokes a, ca- a country's population and the relevancy to, to the product produces your, your market size. I then think that entry complexity is a big factor. So at Revolut, for example, we went to big markets like America, where there's a huge population, it's pretty good product um, relevancy and medium complexity to, to execute. We also went to other countries which were really small, like Singapore population is significantly smaller than the US, but product product um, relevancy is higher and the complexity is less. So I kind of like to simplify this on a very simple matrix. I've seen seen analysts spend weeks and months on really elaborate market sizing and market entry. Um, analysis, but I like to keep a very simple grid um, using these fundamental factors. I think 
the thing that people often miss is localization. You can take a product from one geo and drop it into another one, but if it's not localized, the consumers and the population just will not understand what it is. And that can be as small as swapping out S's for Z's from British to American English to, to changing some of the flows um, which suit the culture and the market norms. That's really important. Yeah, yeah, I think I, uh, I mean, agree with that. I, I, I remember, I think, having a conversation with Intercom, you know, who certainly like a few years ago, maybe this was even like four or five years ago, they weren't really available in France or didn't really have a market in France because the, the users in France wanted a, a platform that was in their local language and Intercom hadn't been localizing that language. But then I believe it now is, and you know, obviously now it can be growing because you know, that's what specifically that, that market kind of needed, right? So initially I was surprised why are Intercom not in France? It's like, well, you know, if you're a, a business worker in France or in customer support that you want something, that's in your own language. It, it, it makes a lot of sense, right? So, um, and it, in terms of the, the geo, like for deal, given that you, I, I know now you're, you're going beyond just kind of re remote work. And so it's for kind of any business, but assuming like is deal a remote sort of distributed business with no office and, and then also when you, when deal, kind of, you know, went global, was that something that, you know, did you look at like specific kind of geos or is it like, hey, deal is available to, you know, anybody in the world sort of thing? So starting with the team, it's only global. We have teammates in 83 countries, I think. In the operations department, we have, I think furthest west would be Hawaii. And then if I go furthest east, we've got New Zealand or, or Japan and <laughs> everywhere else in between. So re really global. That was kind of a natural progression for us. We were certainly practicing what we preached in the early days. So a lot of those international teammates were engaged on like deal 1.0. We had we used our own product to hire them. So we had people all around the world. I think if I take a snapshot of where we are now and where we were 12 months ago, it was really mandatory to have teams everywhere. We split across three times three major regional time zones and then subsequent that into maybe six different shift patterns and we have a follow the sun model in operation so the majority of teams are actually working 24 7 and then we have some teams which are on kind of 12 12 5 um specifically the subject matter experts for certain countries and geos right so Let's say we take Kenya, for example, it's a pretty big employment market. The, the, the subject matter experts in Kenya would, would work uh, Kenyan business hours, which produces a kind of 12, 12 five schedule. So I, I think that answers the first half. <laughs> Second half is um, how do we think about which markets to go to? Well, what I just described was kind of a typical, a typical model. For us, we're kind of like an exporter. So we go into a country and then we're helping talent export their talent to a company else elsewhere. So the way that our market entry framework is driven is really from the, the, the client. So where are biggest clients at? Typically in America, um, in Western Europe, where do they, where do they want to hire? And there are typically some, there are loads of topologies, but there are some kind of prevailing ones we have companies that just want to hire the, the best talent anywhere <laughs> and, and to serve that we need to go everywhere. We then have clients that want to do very targeted expansions. So it might be a US company said, oh, we want to open up um, a center in Mexico, but we don't want to have our own entity. We don't want to take an office building. We want deal to do it all. So we'll do that for them. And then the final one is we have some, some clients that want to go all over certain geo. So maybe they want to build out um, a team across Latam or across across APAC, and then we'll help do that. So, we went to the biggest countries um, f first in terms of demands. So, I think f first three countries on EOR were US, Canada, UK. We now have close to a hundred. So, I, I think speed is really important as well when it comes to expansion, especially when some of your clients want to go everywhere.
when you've found the country that you're looking to expand into, and let's say you, you know it's a European or UK-based company that's setting up in in the US, uh, and obviously you have some experience with that, how do you set up infrastructure rapidly? Practically, we send people to visit that country, or we rely on our, our people in in that country to, to help follow the the steps required. We have we rate countries across four complexities, C1 being the least complex and C4 being the most. Um, most major economies are the, the least complex countries to set up in for what we do. So Canada, US, UK, most of Western Europe, you know, very straightforward. You know, in the UK, you can incorporate a company on company's house in 24 hours and all of that data is available in the public domain. You know, you try and do that in I'm trying to think of an example here. Pakistan, for example, it's it's really tough. No, that's a, it's a C4 country. And when it comes to a C4 country, we'll need to work with specific notary, apostille, consultant. We'll, we'll need to do really in-depth um, licensing analysis against local law, against international law. Maybe a license is required to, to export uh, labor, you know, kind of how we're thinking about it. I would say there's one fun anecdote from all of this is the documents required to set up companies around the world are also highly variable. So UK, it's all digital. You know, you can sign everything on Companies House uh, website at a few clicks. Some of these more complicated countries require stacks and stacks of paper. So they, our executive team do travel a lot to, to meet the team and so forth, we would actually travel with a printer in our luggage. So when we arrived at the next hotel, we could plug the printer in, print off the documents, and then send them off to the bank or to the um, country's local authority or to the company's house. So we would never delay setting up companies. Because if you think about it, like if, you, if there's a lead time on producing the documents, signing the documents, notarizing the documents, it's delaying your expansion. So we literally flew around with printers <laughs> In our luggage. <laughs> Hopefully they were not very heavy printers or like my HP uh, office jet that I, that I have here, but some, some sort of portable printers. But uh, yeah, and I, I wouldn't want to uh, carry them. I, I have heard like some of the founders that we've had on, and, and I think this was specifically kind of scaling to the US, so like European founders scaling to the US, but the amount of paperwork and legal work and legal costs when you're setting up in the US is, you, you know, is uh, a lot. Uh, and it's been something that they underestimated and spent a lot of time and, and money on. Is, is that something that, that you've seen to be true? I think, it's, I think it's true. I think in a market like the US, there's so much optionality when it comes to forming a legal entity and setting up a legal entity. And for instance, you can First of all, choose which state you're going to incorporate in, and then you can choose which state you're going to register in, and then you can choose what type of employment you want to do. It, you know, there's there's, there's so much customization for doing business in the US. Whereas if you do business in the UK, there's one type of company you go for on the company's house. There's one set of employment rules. Payroll's relatively simple. So I think that if you haven't done it before in the states and you are going to a going to a consultant they're just laying out the the brochures right it's like when you're picking out a car you have all of these different features and options it's like i'm overwhelmed i don't know what to, i don't know what to pick i think that's where some of the lawyers and consultants uh, can be helpful but also um, make a lot of money getting to like product market fit is something that actually doesn't really just happen just the once in a company's lifetime Often you're at various stages of getting to product market fit. And if you're, you, you know, selling to SMB, your product market fit with SMB, moving up market, you've got to try and get, S, um, you know, product market fit again. And similarly, when you're expanding internationally, so you might have product market fit, you know, in the UK or in the Netherlands or in Europe. But let's say you're moving into the US, then you're setting up again, you know, and looking to get, you know, product market fit. So how do you get product market fit within the geos that you've launched in? What's your experience there? Talk to the customers and understand their vantage point or viewpoint on things. There might be some, some product, some flow, which 
is very standard to you and, and makes sense. But if you take that to an employee in, in Poland, they might just fundamentally not understand it. I kind of think about, I, I think about similarities in, I'm going to call them lifestyle processes between countries. For example, renting a part, renting a, a flat or an apartment in London is very different to doing it in New York. Like the terms are different. None of the apartments are furnished. When you, when you move out, it's, you normally get all of your deposit back in the UK. I, you know, maybe didn't get my deposit back. It's just a very different kind of lifestyle process. And same for um, opening a bank account, taking a credit card, just so many, so many differences, even like taking the subway. Taking the subway in New York is very different to taking it in London. You, know, you have to be very aware of your surroundings and ensure you're safe. I only just had the contactless tap on. The map isn't clear, blah, 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 blah. So these differences in lifestyle process also apply to, to products and the way people think about products. Um, so you need to speak to the consumers and understand what they want and how they how they need the product to uh, change to feel natural to them. I don't think you need to pick the things that matters and, and change them. So we talked about language, we talked about copywriting. Uh, it might also be some of the functionality you need to change. I think the the local market norms combined with you being a foreign company can produce a competitive advantage because you can be seen as this kind of foreign cool service, which has been really popular in the UK and now it's coming to the States or vice versa. That can be really cool if done well. I think the final thing to say is decentralize as much as you can, especially if your international, international expansion strategy is across many countries. If everything is going back to one general manager, VP, CXO, it's going to become very cumbersome to move quickly. You need to trust your in-country teams that understand the market, that are on the ground speaking with people to make decisions, and then give them the tools to actually do that. Give them, give them the tools to iterate, change products, spend money. Give them boundaries, but make sure that they, they can move without, uh, without approvals. Great advice there, and definitely, I mean, agree on all fronts, and especially, I mean, you know, speaking to the customers, like, it's just a, a, a mantra that we want to get across to, to, to listeners, to founders, you, you know, for, for the founders to be speaking to customers, for their teams, for marketing, you, you know, it's just, you get so much valuable insight and such a pulse on the business that can really kind of help you, and especially at, you know, this product market fit stage. So, uh, an invaluable and, and often, I don't know about, sort of like overlooked, but you, you know, we, often we, we, we see a, a remarkable amount of companies that just don't talk to their customers enough and maybe because they're introverts or, you know, they find it awkward or, or whatever. But uh, it, it's just so valuable, right? It's just so valuable. Absolutely. Moving into the quick fire round, what one thing has moved the needle the most for deal? Deal speed, which is a, a culture or principle of how we work. And in a very basic form, it's do an operation quickly rather than sitting on it. So it might be that you have an unread email in your inbox. If I can get to it on Wednesday night versus Thursday morning, that produces deal speed. And some would argue that those changes are so small and invaluable, but those incremental changes across the entire workforce actually make the organization really fast. Good stuff. I like that one. What is the best advice you've ever received? Identify problems and then establish if you should be solving that problem. What has been your biggest failure and lesson learned? Always not taking action early enough. Uh, specifically, I'll use the customer support organization to deal. We grew incredibly quickly. I saw early warning signs that support was about to be under-resourced and didn't take action early enough. What is the hardest thing about being a COO? I have all the notes I made for this podcast. That's the one thing I didn't make a note for. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's running operations pr proactively. It's, I'm talking about the whole, whole operations organization. Because there's so much going on, there's so much, there's so much change, it's really easy to slip into a reactive mindset you need to be proactive you need to be ahead you need to be planning you need to be consuming and acting on those early warning signs i think that's how you you run a operations organization really well
And what does your daily routine look like? Well, I'm always in different countries, so it, uh, it, it varies. Generally, I'm most creative in the morning. So between 8 and noon is probably when I have the most energy and the most creativity. So I try and I try and cherish that time as much as I as much as I can. So I don't like being on the American time zone because my morning is consumed with meetings. But when I'm in when I'm in Europe, I'll I'll try and get out and active, and that's not necessarily like running five, ten, fifteen k or lifting in the gym. It's it's just like get active in the sense that slip on your sandals and go for a walk and walk the dog and like contemplate things and think about things. And I I found in that time things will surface that might have been forgotten about and it's really valuable for me and it, it stimulates it stimulates creativity just kind of like moving around and not going straight to the desk and uh, straight to the laptop and then in the in the evening uh, I, I try and do uh, the admin the delegation the check-ins that type of stuff how much sleep do you get a night uh, eight hours eight hours that's good any secret to that any sort of routine you have to get eight hours so does it come naturally it, it comes naturally for me. I mean, I, I like to tire myself out f physically and mentally. If I tire myself out mentally, and I, I did this in, in early years at, uh, in the work, you know, working as analyst in Revolut, we would sit at the, at the desk for like 14 hours and not do any physical exercise. And then I would, I would go home to my, uh, to my apartment in London and just couldn't get to sleep. So now I, I really try and um, tire the body as well. So when it gets to like 11 p.m., just out like a light. Moving on, you're coming over to Dublin. So part of your, your travels in October is you're coming to, to speak at SASDOC 2022, uh, which is on the 17th to the 19th of the IDS in, in Dublin. So excited to have you speak at your first SASDOC conference uh, and talk more about deal and its great growth. So what specifically will you be talking about uh, and what can our listeners expect? I'm going to be talking about hiring internationally, which is what our platform does, and that growth journey from one to 100 million in ARR. Very cool. Um, have you have you done many or been to many uh, conferences this year? You're looking forward to being back, you know, at in-person conferences uh, versus virtual. Uh, yeah, yeah, I am. Uh, I haven't been to too many. I've done a, quite a few podcasts and digital digital stuff, but in person, no. So yeah, I, I'm uh, actually never been to Dublin. So looking forward to that. I've been to 50 countries, but never been to Ireland. Oh, well, uh, I, I'm I'm confident you'll you'll love Dublin. It's uh, it's a great city. Lots of fun to be had there, um, but uh, yeah, absolutely love it. So uh, should be a lot of fun and looking forward to seeing you, meeting you in person there. Final couple of questions. What's your favorite business book, if you have one, and uh, what are you currently reading? I'm currently reading The Outsiders, which is a book about American CEOs, which were seen as outsiders, which outperformed markets at various points in history. It's, it's fascinating. And I who's, the, who's the author on that one? Oof, I don't know. It's behind me. Oh. The outside. I'm not sure on the offer, but it's it's a great book. Yeah. Look it up on Amazon or Google or, or whatever. But yeah, it speaks about uh, speaks to pioneering CEOs, which did some really aggressive M and A, corp dev deals, um, shareholder buybacks, um, and yeah, outperformed markets. I would say there's there's elements of, of, of frugality and entrepreneurial spirit throughout. It's 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 kind of I'm not sure if uh, you're familiar with uh, with 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 Carl Icahn and uh, some of the uh, ac activist investing he's done. It's kind of some of that stuff, but from an operator's yeah. point of view within the company. You know, it's not where someone is yeah. taking over the company; it's within, and I think that's really exciting. And yeah, it's my new favorite. Very cool. Good stuff. I haven't heard of it, but I'm going to look that up. And so that's the outsiders uh, for the listeners. So uh, we'll, we'll definitely look that up and link that in the notes. Where can people find you online, uh, Dan? I am on LinkedIn and Twitter. Okay, very cool. Well, hopefully, uh, you know, if people want to connect to Dan, uh, you can reach out on, uh, on LinkedIn or Twitter or meet Dan in person at SASDOC 2022 this October in Dublin. And on, on that note, Dan, thank you so much for being a great guest on the SAS Revolution Show. Uh, sharing the lessons with the SASDOC community. Look forward to seeing you at SASDOC 2022. Thank you, Dan Westcalf, CEO at Deal. Thanks, Alex.